Welcome to Education Futures Reads. I'm John Moravec. I'm Kelly Moravec. And um, yeah, we're off to our book discussion for June, and we are reading Unschooling Rules by Clark Aldrich. And this is 55 Ways to Unlearn What We Know About Schools and Rediscover Education. And um, to me, I think that this was a really nice compliment to the last book we read by Lisa Murphy. Uh, where she's really focused on primary school education, but uh, a lot of real practical things that you could do. And this was really a book of practical things that we could do within homeschooling environments. And so I feel like we kind of jumped a bit in being more inclusive of age groups. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, I really enjoyed the book. It's a quick read, easy read. Uh, it's broken up into 55, I'll call them chapters, but really each one is a half a page to a few pages long. Um, and it just kind of gives you the bare bones. This is, this is what it is. This, this is what we think. Yeah. And I thought the book was just a little bit smart, which is a little bit snarky in its, um, in its take, but I think it was really spot on. I think the ideas that could be really paired with Lisa Murphy's, uh, idea, because when she started her book, she said that we should all just create a binder of, um, uh, create a binder of our ideas that um, that we've been collecting or evidence to support what we've been working on. And I think this is something that it's an idea that could really help this one because this is like 55 rules, but it's it's a rather thin book and there's a lot of evidence. I think that still needs to build in, be mm -hmm. built in. And But I think that through our own experiences, what we do, that we could start uh, developing that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure if we're broadcasting on Facebook or not. Um, this is supposedly uh broadcasting uh but on my facebook stream it looks like that we're starting soon so i'm not sure precisely what's going on um i'm gonna give this a quick tap nope we are live now according to this okay we are live never mind <laughs> hi again <laughs> yeah. all right so so that was what that that uh confused uh language for me or destroying the language for me is uh, all about um, so please join the conversation. Uh, we are monitoring uh, the Facebook comments. So please add in your comments, your thoughts, your ideas, your dreams, um, et cetera, on there. Or if you have ideas for future books that we should be reading and discussing as well, uh, please add those in as well. Yeah, absolutely. We welcome the conversation. Yeah. All right, so Carla says, yes, we are watching. Thank you for the thumbs up <laughs> with that. We give you a couple thumbs up back. So I, I suppose to, to start off, we need to, I think we need to define what is unschooling. Mm -hmm. Now, what is unschooling? What is unschooling? Unschooling just means not being in school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and which is a little bit different from, say, de-schooling, which is the process of, of getting out of school or getting this, the school habits as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, oftentimes... Uh, linked with uh, unschooling or compared to unschooling is homeschooling because I think that's the easiest way that parents are able to tell schools uh, that they're going to begin unschooling is by telling the United States, we tell, or at least in Minnesota, we tell superintendent of schools, hey, I'm going to homeschool my kid. Mm -hmm. um, but homeschooling could also involve a lot of curriculum, a lot of you know, so-called rigor in different areas that unschooling doesn't touch. Right. Be very similar to a typical public school, but at home. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. So you're a public school teacher. Mm -hmm. Is unschooling um, kind of a controversial topic? Um, I don't, I mean, not, at least not with the, the people that I associate with. I don't think, um, I don't know that maybe the idea of unschooling is necessarily all that common, like common knowledge, um, but I don't think it's controversial. Do you have a different sense? I, I don't know. I was just wondering. I've obviously never been a, a school teacher, so I just I don't know. Um, so the author uh, Clark Aldrich argues that most of the knowledge that we gain is through unschooling, and that it's a natural process, yet invisible. And for me, this is one of the most interesting points you brought up because when I read most of the book, uh, I read most of the book online. I did it a night after I gave a talk on actually quite similar stuff and I realized that we're using almost the same language mm -hmm. and main points in in describing things 
Uh, so let's talk about invisible learning and that most of what we learn is done invisibly through uh, non-formal, informal, or serendipitous experiences. And maybe, you know, five, six of what we learn is invisible. So I thought that uh, this book related quite strongly to invisible learning uh, with this 55 ways to, um, uh, or tips for really enabling it. So I was happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Okay. I don't know that there's anyone that could argue that learning happens outside of school, but I think that it becomes, and maybe this is where you were getting the idea of the controversial subject or that language, um, it becomes a little bit more touchy when you think about children ages 5 through 18, which are in the United States anyway, are typical the typical ages of students in our public schools, where learning is seen to be owned, kind of, by what happens in school. And suddenly, once children are enrolled in a, a traditional school, um, what they do outside of school isn't seen as learning anymore. It's seen as play, it's seen as fun. Um, but up until age five, it's hard to argue that students aren't learning because they're not being coached or mentored or taught. Um, we know they learn to speak, they learn to walk, and there's no, you know, there's no lesson plan, there's no assessment, there's no, you know, benchmarks for the, there might be benchmarks, but there's nothing that's overtly um, being taught to, to kids with, with that style of learning. Um, so I think, you know, there, the, the topic becomes maybe a little bit touchy when you think about school age kids and the ways that we use language around what they're learning at school versus what they're learning outside of school. All right. Um, and again, for folks that are joining us, uh, please at, join the conversation in the Facebook comments. I see Gabriela Miyazaki says, Hola, saludos a todos desde México. Hey, Gabriela, nice to see you too. So thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, the, this uh, book is organized, uh, or these 55 rules are organized around what uh, Aldrich calls the seven C's of education. Mm -hmm. So these are curricula, the selection, got content, which is about the pieces, uh, which, and coaching, which is largely the role of the adult in, in learning, uh, customization, building and flexibility, uh, credit, uh, documenting um, how you've been going along, and uh, care or daycare, uh, establishing the, the place um, for unschooling and, to occur. And community. And community, right. The peers. The peers. The peers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so what is learning to you? Oh, that's tough. Um, learning to me, I guess, is when some bit of new knowledge uh, someone takes and combines with what they already know and understand and are able to do, and it becomes uh, something permanent um, within the ways that they do or think about things. How's that? I think. <laughs> I think the idea of learning for me is the, is the permanence piece, um, and it's the combination of something new with your personal context of it. Okay. Hey, uh, Carla Vangsa says that unschooling is forbidden in her country by law. So sorry to hear that. Well, let's think of ways that we could blend unlearning together with formal education, or can we could find ways to, to connect the two together in ways that are meaningful. Yeah. Actually, I think that's something, if I'm looking at our notes, that we're going to hit on a little later in this conversation, right? Yeah, I, I think so. And I, I want to make sure that we bounce back to that. Yeah, so, let's, uh, so Carla, if we don't uh, get back to that, please um, steer us back in, into that uh, direction. So one of the things that... Clark says, or Clark Aldrich says, is that talks about central skills, which to me I was really reading as meaning soft skills. Mm -hmm. That soft skills aren't taught. Yeah. And I suppose my question is: Is unschooling or homeschooling really the best way to learn soft skills? Um. Yeah, I mean, so I'm gonna these. That's the critical skills, right? That you're talking right. about. So it's things like adapting. Um, behaving ethically, being a leader, communicating, gathering evidence, managing projects, negotiating, scheduling, using containment strategies, solving problems, things like that. Right. Um, 
And I think that those th those kinds of ways of thinking or those skills can be learned uh, through a variety of situations in formal schooling and in uh, in more informal schooling, unschooling or homeschooling environments. But I think the the key there is then once you learn them, once you've experienced it, then how is that intentionally being applied to other situations? And that's the key for me. Again, you asked what I think learning means. It's the permanence though of it. So you may ha use great problem solving skills on one thing because that's what it called for. But if those skills don't somehow become permanent mm -hmm. and something that you can apply to something else, then I would say it's not necessarily learning. Right. I think that also with soft skills development, there's an incredible need for learning by doing. Mm -hmm. A lot of it just can't be uh, verbally transmitted or transmitted, say, through reading books. You just have to learn by doing, like mm -hmm. riding a bicycle. I mean, mm -hmm. You could take a class on how to ride a bicycle, but until you actually have that that intensive lab work of doing it by yourself, you're not going to have any clue on how to ride a bicycle. Right. And I think that's one of the, the benefits that come out of unschooling because it really pushes people out to do things and get out in their environment and interact. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting rules that you opened up with, I liked um, rule six, which was avoid the false dichotomy of the vocational or academic track. So you and I attended a conference session last week that focused on vocational, which is now C, called CTE, Career and Technical Education. Mm -hmm. um, Aldrich claims that it's immoral to have a separation to track kids into separate pathways. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? I agree. Um, you know, I think that kids need to be exposed to all different kinds of things all the time so that they know... And, and, and what they're what they're curious about, what they're interested in, you know, you, you you only know what what you know and what you've seen and what you've been exposed to. If you haven't been exposed to something, maybe there's a missing piece that you'll never know. Um, so I think you know, it, I think having tracks, a CTE track versus an academic track, that that idea is okay as long as students are still able to participate in in all variety of those things they're not they're not tracked in one track and they have to stay in that one track if a student wants to take you know an, a, a, an art class for instance sure. but they're you know in some other heavy academic track that should still be okay to be able to explore all facets of their interests be exposed to things right and for me it's like i, I think it's not just within schools but i think elsewhere in society um, that we tend to look at people within these tracks and so for me, I have a, a strong act, academic background, uh, but and I also can do things on computers. I can write programs, and I was up late last night uh, working working on stuff. Uh, but when it's time to apply for jobs or go to interviews or something, you're viewed within either one of those two tracks uh, without looking at at w what you can do con comprehensively as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to get better into communicating or developing or acknowledging uh, the whole person learning uh, quite a bit. Yeah, I think that maybe is starting to change in some areas, though. I was on a field trip with some of our my um, students, uh, ju juniors, I think, um, to the nerdery. And they talked about, you know, that that you know, you may have a computer science background or, or a coding mm -hmm. background, but they're really looking at what you've done um, as opposed to just what schooling you've had um, and that your experience weighs just as heavily, if not more heavily, than the, than the, the formal educational experiences. Mm -hmm. And the Nerdery is a local boutique uh, software uh, foundry um, just down the street from us. Mm -hmm. But they're oh, nationwide. They have other areas too. I think just the one in Bloomington is the largest. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Rule number nine, uh, getting into uh, getting into content of it, the pieces. Rule number nine, uh, sitting through a classroom lecture is just is just not unnatural for most people. It is painful. I think I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Why do we still do that? Because that's the way it's always been done. I mean, that's why. I don't think there's any other response than that. It's painful, and people people can't sit through it. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the talk I, I gave last week, I should have loaded up the slide on this thing to share, but 
um, I said that we, you know, we cure non-compliance for sitting through lectures or not doing or not fitting into these these uh, these molds of things that we do for no reason with like medication. We say, hey, the kid can't sit still through my lecture. Must have ADHD. Let's prescribe Adderall. Mm -hmm. How do we do that stuff? Well, I'm not sure I agree with you on that, but I, as a public school teacher, um, it, it's definitely focused on forced compliance. And there's definitely an idea that something is wrong with a child who can't or won't sit still through, you know, a 45 or 50 or 60 minute long class. Um, and so, you know, we spend lots of time in our teacher preparation classes and then even beyond that doing professional development around behavior management which basically means how do we force them to comply with, in this case, our, our ridiculous rule of having to sit in a seat and, and, and I'm gonna say listen in, in quotes because they're not necessarily listening. Right. A, a teacher doesn't have a problem with a child who's sitting quietly but not learning because they're sitting quietly and not causing a disrupt, disruption. Um, the only time there's a problem is when a student is not sitting quietly and not learning. So speaking about learning, uh, rule 10 is animals are better than books about animals. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. I mean, for me, that was real, a real bingo moment uh, communicating some of the key ideas because uh, it really talks about teaching soft skills, soft skills development, especially empathy. And I thought that was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about what you mean about how that helps them develop empathy? Well, I think being in contact with with uh, actual animals rather than saying reading about it in a book or watching a video, but touching, sensing, feeling, hearing, um, building, I would say, more authentic sensory connections mm -hmm. um, helps to build that. Sure. Okay. So that makes sense as far as the animals go. I guess I was reading that rule as a little bit more uh Global, uh -huh. and it reminded me of um, the time I was at a school in Wisconsin and was uh, observing a seventh grade science class and some boys reading in a textbook and I said what are you learning and they said um, we're learning how to use a microscope and there weren't any microscopes that I could okay. see even in the classroom mm -hmm. they were just reading it and I said oh I wonder if there's a another way to learn about using microscopes and they were baffled, and they showed me up on the board where the objective was written for the day, and then they kind of looked at each other, and then they looked at me, and one of them sort of timidly said, well, maybe we could try to use one. And I said, All oh, right. yeah, maybe you could learn about using a microscope by actually using one. Um, yeah, and I think that's, that to me was where, what um, Clark Aldrich was getting at with that idea of animals are better than books about animals. I think it's just that real-world experience and but then it's how do you take that experience, transfer it to something new? Because that's where the learning is. That's where it's taking place. Mm -hmm. Cool. Rule sixteen is embrace all technology. Um, I'm kind of wondering how can we use technologies smarter to break students free of a teacher's past or preconceived notion of doing things or learning? Because mm -hmm. I think too often we use new technologies to do the same old stuff. And oftentimes then within a classroom, that reflects what a teacher does or a teacher's thinking, a te teacher's approach to things. But, at, but when we embrace all technologies, um, especially in creative ways, then we start using new technologies to do new stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I really like that, that mindset a lot. Yeah. I just had a, a conversation about this with um, one of my close friends yesterday, who's also a teacher, um, and talking about the 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 biggest complaint that we both hate that we hear from our, our teacher colleagues is well I don't have time for for that and looking at it as an extra layer or something else or something new and this mindset of teaching the technology for the sake of teaching the technology instead of looking at it as a tool and um, my friend Jen was uh, sort of joking but sort of serious with their the uh, media director at their school because all of their writing curriculum and their math work is online. So students are at our schools have um, Chromebooks that they're assigned, but then they're collected at the end of the year. We still have a week of school left, and they've already turned in their Chromebooks. They turned them in last week, early. And so okay. Jen, my friend, picked up a big stack of paper and a bunch of pencils and said, here, do you want to take this too? <laughs> <laughs> because they're, those are all tools. 
I think sometimes we get lost in this idea of technology, that te technology means a phone or an iPad or, or a Chromebook, and we forget that pencils are technology too. Pens are technology too. Your paper is technology. Uh, they're, all of them are just tools to help with the learning. So you select the tool that is the best for ensuring that that learning is going to be personal and, and make sense to the student and then stick with them. Um, and that, to, in my mind, might be a Chromebook or it might be a pen and paper. It might be a ping pong ball, it, you know, sure. any variety of tools. I think that echoes the great Douglas Adams, um, who taught us that technology is a word that just describes something that we don't know what it, what it does yet. Uh, mm -hmm. Like a pen is a piece of technology, but we know what it does, so we call it a pen. Yeah. A chair is a piece of technology. We know what it does, so we call it a chair. But if it's magical, we don't know what it does yet, it's technology. Mm -hmm. So I like that. And yeah. I think that echoes very much uh, what the great Douglas Adams uh, had to say about that. Mm -hmm. And again, for folks joining us on Facebook, please feel free to join the conversation in the comments box. I have no idea if anybody's watching or how many people are watching because the Facebook uh, stream view on, on my iPad seems to be a little bit wonky here. Uh, but uh, feel free to join, to join the conversation by adding your thoughts and comments. Rule number 19 mm -hmm. is have a well-stocked library. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's an easy one. I don't think... Anybody would argue with that, but, or instead of, but, and, mm -hmm. I know you have a story about that um, with um, Sun Hillel's um, early childhood education. I do. I, I'm, I guess maybe I took something a little bit different from the Clark Aldrich's rule. You know, well, well stock Library, I think the purpose of that is to have a variety of topics and um, reading levels and experience levels and you know things like that have a have a literacy rich environment that's what we say in my field mm -hmm. um, so that students have their children have the opportunity to kind of immerse themselves in whatever they choose um, so with my son as a, a preschooler um, he I had the option of entering him into kindergarten early so before he turned five um, or keeping him out of kindergarten and waiting to send him for another year. And I, I, part of the, the, the urgency in that decision is, was because of his, um, kind of his social behaviors and, uh, needing to be around typical peers more than he had access to. And so I asked everyone I knew to, who, you know, their thoughts on it and, you know, kind of explained everything. That's sort of my process for solving problems. Uh, is to gather as much information as I can and talk about it over and over, as you know. Um, and so one of the people that I asked was Dr. Richard Cash, who at that time was the director of the Gifted and Talented Programming in Bloomington. Mm -hmm. um, and he suggested keep him out, don't send him early, um, but instead take him everywhere. Take him to the zoo, take him to the science museum, take him to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. um, but just take him everywhere, expose him to as much as I possibly could, um, and, and have him do the learning that way instead of in a more structured, defined way. Um, as a, as a four-year-old, not quite five-year-old, the director of our gifted and talented programming suggested that would be better learning for him than heading to kindergarten early. Which is rule number 25. Mm -hmm. Expose more, teach less. Mm -hmm. I love it. Uh, but right before rule 25 is rule 24 we start looking at the adults role uh, in coaching uh teaching is leadership most teaching is bad leadership oh that's snarky but it made me laugh a little bit because mm -hmm. i thought it was a little funny uh we got a comment from uh, gabriella the ubiquity of learning makes it possible to to learn from there and everyone any moment and with anyone ah to Makes it possible to learn for everyone in any moment and any time, anyone. Yeah, I think you really get the ubiquitous learning and making sure that educational experiences are not just compartmentalized towards certain hours in certain places, yeah. like in school from seven forty-five to two thirty-seven p.m. Yeah, any place, any time with anyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's. Um, part, I don't know if we, maybe when we get down to the peers part, but um, the idea of grouping kids with people of the same age 
is doesn't necessarily extend their learning anyway there's you know the kids learn different things at different times and by assuming that everyone learns the same way we're not necessarily meeting all kids needs now, i want to go back to what the rule 24 though sure teaching is leadership most teaching is bad leadership i i i don't as a teacher, that's not ever how I saw my role, so I have a little bit of a hard time with that. I get that what Clark Aldrich is saying is that that's how it's mostly seen, is that kind of sage on the stage idea where you stand up in front of people and you're the one that knows everything and you're imparting this knowledge onto the people. But um, I think that's changing somewhat. I don't think that I'm unique in my idea that that's not my role as a teacher. It was snarky. Yeah. It was a snarky one. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It made me laugh a little bit, mm -hmm. and I think that sometimes it's okay. Uh, rule 29, homework helps school systems, not students. I thought that was kind of hilarious, too, because, um, well, not hilarious, but a little sad, but is it really, really illustrated or really brought up the point that that the point of homework is not so much for the student learning, but rather is to fulfill more of the needs of the the teacher too often, uh, at least in the traditional homework. And um, a lot of it, as we're watching with, with our own kid here, has been just kind of, a lot of it's been rather pointless exercises that really just benefit the teacher. Mm -hmm. And so if write a story that you would like, that reflects your passion, that you could tend to putting in quality in, write something, and then highlight certain words, some colors, other words, other colors, and circle things, and then then send it in, which, which really took the fun out of doing the homework or connecting with uh, authentic work that a student could have done in their in their home time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm not sure that helps anyone, the school system or the students. It seems like it's just an exercise to do it. Mm -hmm. So what about the flipped classroom where the canned content like videos um, can be viewed at home and then and coming to school uh, more of a seminar type experience? Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Um, I haven't really seen much success with that, I guess. Um, there, there, there are issues with it, like access, um, mm -hmm. where if you have students who are unable to view that canned content at home, then they're already behind once they get to school. And then that time, the seminar time, like you suggested, I instead is spent watching the or interacting with whatever it was they were supposed to have done at home. So then they're missing out on these other th opportunities that are taking place during that allotted class time. Um, I mean, I think it it was one idea to maximize the amount of, of quality instruction maybe that takes place during a cl class time and in such a way that is more differentiated for different student needs. But I haven't seen it very successful in my experience. Okay. Rule 31 is avoid the Stockholm Syndrome. And for me, that's a really big take. Now, the Stockholm Syndrome is, is um, I suppose, a psychological condition that happens when somebody is taken hostage and they eventually build empathy and um, likes for the hostage taker and uh, sympathy for the hostage taker. And for me, I think this is something that I have seen in interactions with uh, many parents uh, who themselves do not have good experiences. Uh, but want their kids to learn in similar, similar ways that they did. And they can meet with the uh, parents. So my first job out of college was I worked at a bank. It's where a lot of people with liberal arts degrees wind up working as in a bank and become trust officers or compliance officers or something. It's, it's not where they wanted to be when they were kids, when they think about, gosh, when I grow up, I want to be a compliance officer. No, when they, when they grow up, they want to be astronauts or firemen or, or horse trainers or whatever. Um, and a lot of these people have had really bad experiences in school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you start having kids, they want to put their kids in similar schools that they did because, hey, I didn't turn out so bad. I work at a bank. I do a lot of accounting. And I think that's 
it's an interesting thing because it kind of feeds back into that that cycle where we're not having sort of an impulse for change coming from the parents. Mm -hmm. Or I think maybe too, they just want to see their children successful in ways that they themselves didn't feel successful. Right. Mm -hmm. Rule number 32, mm -hmm. schools are designed to create both winners and losers. It's a sorting mechanism, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, when you take children all of the same age and put them in the same room and expect that they will all learn the same things in the same ways you can't help but have people who w win at that i guess and and lose at that that's how it was designed oh. um he clark aldrich in that section talks about he, he's framing that around this like the bell curve and grading in that way which i haven't seen in public schools ever I, not in my experience anyway. I've worked in three different schools and we never did that. Um, so that's maybe a little bit of an archaic idea. Mm -hmm. But it's I still believe that with, with, in that statement that we are creating winners and losers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I went to school, um, I had some teachers that uh, really believed in that bell curve mm -hmm. as, a, as a way to for them to grade fairly. And I thought, yeah, that's tough. Mm -hmm. Um, rule number 35, be what schools pretend to be, not what schools are. Mm -hmm. And I like that. I think that a lot of these other rules are kind of focused on the negative. They do all, a lot of the negatives. But I really like this one because it's about refocusing the mindsets and getting back to really focusing on attending to learning mm -hmm. uh, rather than the, say, the management of learning. And I thought... Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, in that section he talked about um, taking, looking at a school's mission and vision statements, um, but then comparing them to what's actually happening and realizing that the, the mission and vision are fantastic, that's what we would all want, but then seeing that, no, that's not quite what's actually happening in there. Um, and I think that's probably, you know, those mission and vision statements are what you're striving for, and I think that the, the, the people that are making the decisions around programming and structure and policies and things like that are are keeping those things in mind when they're making decisions about what they're implementing. Um, but because of the way that, that our school systems are structured, they're not going to reach those goals, I don't think. I don't think it's possible. Mm -hmm. Rule number 39 is five subjects a day. Really? Not so much a rule as much as it's a plea for action, plea for help. Okay, I, I think, yeah, this is school scheduling is one of those great mysteries and the great challenges. Uh, how do we schedule organized learning between 7.45 and 2.37 p.m.? And then we break it down even further and uh, compartmentalize and say for the next 45 minutes, we're going to learn math. And the mm -hmm. next 45 minutes, we're going to do language arts. And then... Then we're going to have uh, 36 minutes for lunch, and then, mm -hmm. <laughs> or less, probably. Um, but, yes. but it also means that, that for only this 45 minutes, we're going to focus on math. For only this 45 minutes, we're going to focus on language arts. I think there's been many efforts for cross-curriculum cl uh, cl collaboration, but that's still a very difficult thing. Yeah, and I, there aren't enough of those collaborations. Um, and that's, like I mentioned before about learning, it's that transferability, and, and that's not happening. Uh, students, at least when I was in the classroom, if I did something in my room and I taught reading that connected with what they had done in social studies or science or language arts, they were appalled. We already did that. We did that in math. We did that in science. A and co couldn't understand at all that, well, maybe we do the same kinds of thinking in here too, that you're learning that somewhere else that you can, you know, for the purpose of being applied and transferred to a new situation. But that's not, th that thinking can't be supported in a system where you have 45 minutes for math and then 45 minutes for science and there's no collaboration between, there's no opportunity for that learning transfer. Excellent. And again, for those of you uh, joining in on Facebook, please uh, join the conversation by posting your comments. Uh, I am worried that my my iPad's um, view of this video is not giving me the 
not give me all the data or conversation. I know there are more people joining than it says there are, uh, like Gabriel is posting stuff and does that you weren't here. So I don't know what's going on, uh, but please do uh, join in the conversation uh, by posting your comments, your thoughts, questions, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and we'll respond to them. Again, we are talking about Unschooling Rules by Clark Aldridge. It's 55 ways to unlearn what we know about schools and rediscover education. So rule number 42, got grouping, grouping students by age is just a bad idea. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't agree more. In real life, this is just simply not how we operate. Yeah. I don't work with other 41-year-olds right. only and, uh, or people in like near age groups. I work with people from across many ages or all ages, mm -hmm. uh, including kids. Uh, so why have we been doing that in mainstream education? I don't know. I huh? don't know the history of how that came about. I don't know either. It's one of, one of those great mysteries that we've been doing this thing and don't know why. Mm -hmm. We can order kids by height. <laughs> we could order them by the number of teeth they have. I don't know, but no, we the do color it. color of shirt they're wearing color of shirt day. they're wearing, yeah. Like Blue shirts, you're in that room. <laughs> Polka dots, we're not sure. You're off to go to the principal's office for determination. Hair color. Hair color. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just what we do. Rule number 43. And this was minimize the drop off. And maybe that's one that you should take. Because I imagine that you have a very different opinion on that when I was reading that. Mm -hmm. So, what Clark Aldrich means when he says minimize the drop off is um, parents taking their kids to a dance class or to a birthday party and leaving them there and going and doing something else. And what he's suggesting is staying. Uh, and I don't agree with that at all because I think kids need opportunities to interact without you. <laughs> and you don't need to sit there for every soccer practice. They need to go and play soccer and mess around with their friends and without your watchful eye. I very few times have stayed at dance class or, you know, things like that. Now, for the dance performance, of course, you sit and watch that. But I can't imagine going, inviting myself into a child's birthday party just so I can sit there and monitor my child's behavior. That's just, that seems ridiculous to me. That, that, that doesn't place any trust in my children. It doesn't place any sense of responsibility on on them for their own behaviors. It doesn't give them opportunity to learn socially in a social setting what's expected within that group of people. It doesn't make sense to me, I guess. Yeah, I think there's also the question of developing independence uh, mm -hmm. within children. And there is a bit of a free range movement as well. So it's not just dropping your kids off at soccer practice or uh, at dance class, but it's let the kids uh, find their own fun in the neighborhood mm -hmm. um, as well. I think that can also relate to those ideas as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so rule number 45, tests don't work. Get over it. Move on. Mm -hmm. I think tests work. Tests do exactly what they're developed to do. It, there's, it, I mean, they don't work for learning. But they definitely work to see how well a student knows what the test maker is wanting to see if they know. Sure. Well, I think that tests are great at measuring your ability to take that test. Right, yeah. But I also think it's a very fair question to ask what has been learned. Mm -hmm. um, if resources are being spent on education or on learning, I think that there, this accountability question is valid. So if tests don't work to now if, if we're learning, then we need to start thinking about what we could start asking to address this issue. So in Manifesto 15, we wrote, uh, don't value what you measure, measure what you value. And we really need to take a, a harder look at what we value and finding new ways or more authentic ways for measuring that and connecting more with learning, which I believe is very much a personal thing. So maybe it's how do we how are we looking at personal expressions of things? Mm -hmm. And this is really hard to measure and collect and report back up to 
um, mega funding bodies like the federal government. Um, but I think that's a direction that we need to start getting into. Well, I have a little bit of a hard time with that because when I learn something, I don't necessarily feel like I need to share that with everybody. I'm fine with just knowing that I've learned it and then using it from now on. Sure. Um, and so if we're suggesting to kids that they need to share with us what they've learned um, to satisfy the government or the the school system or whatever, um, I I don't I just don't agree with that. I have a hard time, I guess, allowing it, uh, someone to learn what they want to learn, what they need to learn at any given time, but then saying, yeah, but then you have to prove it because you, proving it to myself that's that's good enough for me. Right. Um, but not you. You have to prove your learning to me. I, I have a tough time with that. All right. So related to this is rule number 46, which is the future is portfolios, not transcripts. I don't think anybody would really argue with that, but I think that's also kind of a, another way of testing or demonstrating. And we talked about earlier that this book could have used a folio of evidence to support uh, these rules and ideas that are put forth. And, you know, that bind, like Lisa Murphy's create a binder for things. Um, I think that it's also important that the format, the breadth, and the, and the depth of the portfolio should also be unique to also match an individual's uniqueness as well. And to also encapsulate what a, cho what a student chooses to share, not what they're expected to share, but what that student chooses to share. But and, regardless, you're putting an expectation on them that they have to share. Maybe. But I think we need something that's looser than what we have been doing through standard portfolios or e-portfolios, which were kind of like a big thing a decade ago, but haven't really gone anywhere. Um, but we really need to reconceptualize that and enable students to find their own way and uh, and enable them to to share in unique and creative ways if they choose to. Right, but that's the whole point is the choice. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. And with testing and with main portfolio schemes, there isn't a choice. Right. Get that in there. All right. Again, for our folks uh, who join us on Facebook, uh, please join in the comments. Um, yeah, we're here. We're uh, we're reading them, and we are. Discussing Clark Aldrich's Unschooling Rules, uh, 55 Ways to Unlearn What We Know About Schools and Rediscover Education. Mm -hmm. Rule number 50, and this is, a, this is a big one. It's not so much of a big one for me, but for many other people, this has been a big one. It says, Outdoors Beats Indoors. And this has been a really popular topic in the unschooling and democratic schooling world. Mm -hmm. Do you have any inkling as to why? Well, because indoors, there it, it's constrained. You're limited to what you can do and the experiences that you can have by what you find indoors. Right. Outdoors, it's wide open. You can walk up and down the street, like I've done many times with our grandson, picking up acorns and rocks and squatting down and investigating ant hills and things that you just don't find in the house. Right. When we visited the UDEC uh, conference, two years ago, uh, Manifesto 15 was a highlighted aspect of it. And several folks came up and asked us uh, why there isn't a nature component mm -hmm. uh, in that. And um, I didn't have a good answer as to why or why not. It just wasn't on the, wasn't something that really came up with me. But I also thought that putting a nature component on it has been kind of constraining, saying you need exposure to nature. I think exposure to nature is great, but I don't think that it's something that should be prescri prescribed. Do you, are you suggesting then that the other points of Manifesto 15 are somewhat constraining and that you're, there's a suggestion there by you that those things have to be done? That is never how I've read it. Nah. But just the nature piece. Well, the nature piece, yeah, the students need to spend more time, more time outside. I just, but I thought, it was my opinion, I thought that then too constraining. Right. Well, if, yes. If you word it like that, yeah. students need to. Yeah. But if it's something like what Clark Aldridge said, outdoors is better than indoors, or outdoors beats indoors, that's not 
Right, Telling whatever. people what to do. Whatever. <laughs> okay. We're almost out of rules here. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, rule number 53. Parents care more than any institution about their children. Duh. Uh, duh, yeah. I mean, so, you know, my take is our school systems are based on cultures of obedience and forced compliance and complacency. And parents, health professionals, teachers, the police are called upon to become enforcers of this as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that may be a big piece of this that we need to start finding other ways that parents can show that they care more about their children than, than being expected to be the enforcers. Mm -hmm. And I also think though that teachers care a lot about their students. And, but because of the way that the system is structured right now, it also puts them into a place where they are enforcers. Um, I don't think most teachers would choose to punish kids for their natural inclination to wiggle around and move and, and interact with one another, but because of the constraints that are put upon them, that's the only option. I think we can't necessarily um, suggest that it's the teachers that... that uh, that are at fault here for that. It's the system itself. Um, and and I know from personal experience, I care a lot about my students, past students, present students. Um, certainly not more than their parents do, of course, because that would be sure. absurd. Um, but there are a lot of caring individuals working with the same small people mm -hmm. that could come together in better ways. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, and so the final rule, and I think this is critically important, is that the only sustainable answer to the global education challenge is a diversity of approaches. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a cleverly stated one because it's a global education challenges, a, a global education challenge, but we don't have a diversity of approaches. We've all seemed to bought into. Um, one method of doing things, one form of what a school looks like. We can go from country to country to country, walk into a place and go, oh, this is a school. Uh, we can recognize it by by just a p maybe one piece of furniture or just small bits and pieces that a school looks like a school and oftentimes or most often are structured exactly the same among places. Mm -hmm. I think that we've become so afraid of failing that we just stopped trying doing anything different. Mm, I don't think so. I don't think it's about fear of failure. I think it's there. Okay, first of all, there are definitely other options besides just the typical school worldwide. We, I mean, we have friends in UDEC who have schools all over that are not a typical public school. Um, but that trend isn't. Maybe it's growing, but it's growing slowly, really slowly. Um, so there are some options, and unschooling is an option. Homeschooling is an option. There are other options, Dif different, kind, different kinds of charter schools that offer different things um, are options. But I think um, maybe, I think the growth maybe isn't as fast as it should be, and I think that what's limiting for big systems, institutions like what we have in our public schools right now, is considering how. I think it's just like when we talked about the mission and the vision statements, that, that you know, in, in most schools, they're amazing, and if that's what they were actually doing, it, they would be uh, fantastic places where learning happens. But when you start to think about, you know, these 55 rules and how you can possibly implement each of them into something that, like you said, is globally recognized, then the question becomes how. And that, I think, to many people feels so daunting. It's impossible to start trying to think how to do it small. And just like like Peter Gray, when we talked with him and, and I asked, well, can is it possible at all to have some like a school within a school where, you know, it's focused in on these kinds of principles and 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 he says no we, we we cannot change what is currently within the public school system in the in that model to to have it be what we need for kids it it has to be a complete 
we, we, we scrap what we've been doing and do something new. And that task is enormous and it's daunting. He says that the public education is, is hopelessly coercive. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't agree in the hopeless part, but I really do think that we could do a lot better at attending to the creation of an ecology of options. Mm -hmm. And too often we don't have options or, you know, we could say things like, oh, just, you know, get into unschooling or start a democratic school. But that's really hard to do. That's mm -hmm. it requires us to kind of uh, really hack the system, try things out or in some places break the law. Mm -hmm. uh, many places it's, a it's illegal to unschool or democratic schools uh, in various places in the Western world have been sued or the parents have been sued for sending their kids to, to a school that does something different because maybe they don't test the same way, they don't evaluate the same way, and the government can't figure it out. Mm -hmm. So if you're not testing, maybe you're not a school. I mean, these are some ridiculous things. Mm -hmm. And so we need to build in the flexibility within the system uh, to enable people to to create an ecology of options, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, so absolutely. That's just my take. Mm -hmm. That's uh, or my two cents. Then another $2.37 and get you a cup of coffee down the street. All right. Yep. So I, uh, we're out of rules because uh, he had 55 rules, and that was rule number 55. Yeah. And I'm out of things to talk about because it's really hot in here. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Hey, I want to say thank you to everybody uh, who joined us. Uh, Guadalupe, Mark, Gabriela, uh, Shini, thank you so much for uh, joining us and, and others. Um, and for the next, for our next book club discussion, we're going to read our very own Nomad Society, which, by the way, is a free download at nomadsociety.com. And if you'd rather read it in Spanish, it's available also for free at sociedadnomad.com. And yeah, we'll talk about that the first uh, Saturday in July um, on Facebook, um, same time. Mm -hmm. So again, thank you very much for joining us, and we will see you in a month. Any parting words? Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining. Okay, bye.